there are two types of airbrushes, single action and double action. The difference between the two is in the trigger mechanism. Single action airbrushes apply increasing amounts of both air and paint in a uniform manner as the trigger is pulled back, as you can see here with the needle retracting into the body. The double action airbrushes separate the flow of air and paint and allow you to control the flow of each independently. Pushing down on the trigger controls the airflow and pulling back controls the paint flow. Generally, the mid to high end airbrushes allow you to preset a cutoff point, which sets the maximum volume of paint allowed to flow through the airbrush. This can be an extremely useful feature and should be used as when airbrushing for lengthy periods, the occasional muscle spasm may lead to multiple expletives being used. This is also a vital feature when airbrushing fine detail, as it will keep the amount of paint allowed through to a minimum, thereby maintaining consistent patterns or lines. When painting with the airbrush, the distance from the model will vary depending on the amount of paint being allowed through the airbrush in addition to the air pressure set. At this point, a consistent air pressure should be used, generally between 10 and 15 psi, again depending on the distance you prefer to hold the airbrush at. When painting fine detail, the airbrush can be used several millimetres away from the model, ensuring that only minimal paint is allowed through the airbrush. When spraying larger volumes of paint, greater distances are required, depending on the airbrush. However, 10 to 15 centimetres is a good distance. A general guide is to thin the paint with 50% thinner, with the aim being to achieve the consistency of milk. If you wish to mix the paint in the airbrush, add a few drops of thinner first to stop it from clogging up the airbrush. Spraying an undercoat on any model is an absolute must. For this, undercoat products should be used, as they have special formulations which assist with the paint bonding to the plastic. The undercoat will ensure that the following paint layers adhere to the model effectively, and thereby vastly reducing the risk of chipping or paint peeling away. When using an airbrush to spray the undercoat, it is necessary to apply the coat in sections on the model. First spray a thin layer marking out the sections. This layer should be translucent as you can see. Then carefully build up the paint layers until it is completely covered. Make sure that the boundaries between the various sections are blended. Using a 0.2mm airbrush to spray a large model can be a great deal of work. However, this allows a greater degree of control. The choice of how big a spray cone you wish to use, again, comes down to personal preference. When spraying the undercoat from a can, or any type of painting with a can for that matter, it is recommended that the can be held a good distance from the model, generally at least 20 centimetres away. However, read the instructions on the can itself for a more accurate guide. For best results, begin spraying before the model, then walk the paint stream onto the model, then off again, before releasing the nozzle. This is done to minimise paint splatter which can often occur when the nozzle is first depressed, and less frequently when it is released. When painting with a can, short bursts can be used, and you should rotate the locations around and allow the paint to settle before reapplying another burst onto the same area. The next step in the painting process is called pre-shading. If you have opted to go with a white undercoat, then it is a simple matter of spraying black lines across all or most of the panel lines. The thickness of a black line will, up to a point, determine the fading effect produced. Keep in mind, however, that it depends on how you spray the main colours afterwards, and if you spray them on too thick, you can cover up the pre-shading altogether.
With a black undercoat, the reverse occurs. White is now sprayed in the middle of each panel and is gradually built up. This method can produce better results as it allows greater control with not just the location of the faded areas, but the intensity of the fading can be controlled more effectively than the black pre-shading. As you can see, all the little squares in between the rivets are sprayed and the larger panels are treated as a whole. As a rule of thumb, at least two to three layers of white should be sprayed. Using photos as a reference will greatly assist in choosing the degree of weathering. However, this will be covered in greater detail in future episodes. You can see here the final results of the pre-shading. Note the belly of the aircraft in the middle screen, how it has received less attention with the white when compared to other parts. The one exception to the importance of an undercoat is the canopy. A neat little trick is to spray the colour of the cockpit interior as the base, then the colour of the airframe on top. The base colour will be seen through the clear plastic saving you the trouble of spraying inside the canopy. However, for professional results, the interior should be masked and sprayed separately. This is probably one of the most difficult endeavours any modeller can undertake, due to the extreme difficulty of masking the interior side of most canopies. Now it is time for the main colours to be applied, and two thin coats are sprayed in quick succession. It is important that the whole surface of the model receive adequate paint coverage, that is, that the actual colour can be seen. The areas which were not shaded with white may require a little more paint than the white areas. When painting, it is better to stop if in doubt and let it dry, as more layers can be added, but it is nearly impossible without scrapping the paintwork and starting again to remove the paint. When deciding whether to paint using enamel paints or acrylic, there are several things to consider. Enamels will generally endure the test of time better and keep the original colour for longer. However, they produce unpleasant fumes and should always be used in a well ventilated room. They also take much longer to dry, several hours to be touch dry and generally two to three days to cure properly. Acrylics, on the other hand, take 12 to 24 hours to cure and can be touch dry within a matter of minutes. However, it is best not to handle them for at least 20 minutes. This will allow for many coats or colours to be applied within a short space of time and therefore may be a better choice when time or patience is in short supply. Often, acrylic paints may require the use of paint retarders as they may clog up the airbrush during longer painting sessions. A vital step after painting is to apply a gloss varnish to the model. This is done for two reasons. Firstly, to protect the paintwork from the ink wash process, and secondly, to give the decals a smooth surface to adhere to. Be sure to use the opposite type of varnish from the wash to be used, that is, acrylic or enamel. Ideally, this should also be the opposite to the paintwork underneath. So, for example, acrylic paint, enamel varnish and then acrylic wash, or vice versa. However, 
The varnish may be the same base as the paint without causing too many problems. Apply two coats of the gloss varnish. Then gently rub the whole plane down with 2000 grade sandpaper until a uniform and smooth finish is attained. Pay careful attention during this process. And if you see any signs of the paint below being removed, stop and reapply additional coats of varnish. Once the plane is smooth, apply one more coat of varnish on top. If you skip this process, you run the high risk of your decal silvering. To apply the decal, cut out the decal from the sheet, then dip it in warm water for up to 10 seconds. Aftermarket decals are generally thinner than the kit ones, and thus usually require less time in the water. Place the wet decal on some paper towel for approximately 30 to 60 seconds until it easily slides off the sheet. If this does not occur, simply place it in the water again for a few extra seconds. Once the decal is placed in position, Brush on some decal softening solution and be sure to clean up any excess drops. Here you can see what the softening solution does to the decal over a period of one hour. If you leave too much of the solution on the decal, it will cause it to become deformed, as can be seen on the right screen. Do not touch the decal during this time, as it can tear easily. It is possible to repeat this process if the decal is excessively thick and refuses to conform to the contours of the model properly. By far the most difficult decals are the long lines. If they rip, they can be gently rejoined on the model. Simply wet the decal with water and use a paintbrush and or fingers to maneuver it into place.
There are many ready-made ink washes available from various companies. Again, this will come down to personal preference as to which works best for you. Alternatively, many modelers in the community prefer to use thin-down artist oils. The ink wash is applied to all the panel lines and rivets. Try and minimise the application of the wash, as it will reduce the amount of work required during the cleanup process. To begin, dip the cotton bud in some thinner. It needs to be moist, but not totally wet. The cleanup process is relatively simple. However, patience and care should be exercised, as it is possible to overdo it and begin removing the paint underneath. Gently wipe off any excess ink wash. This should be done in the direction of the airflow. You can leave some streaks here and there for extra effect, especially from the smaller panels and random rivets. Now that the core of the model is complete, the whole plane is sprayed with a matte varnish. Give it two reasonable coats, however, be careful not to overdo it, as this will create a build up of varnish which may turn white. If this occurs, it can be removed carefully with either a blade or a fingernail. Sandpaper is not recommended at this stage, and if it still persists, you can dissolve the varnish with the appropriate thinner. However, use this very sparingly. Once the self-adhesive foil which was used to mask the canopy is removed, it may leave behind some adhesive residue. This can be easily removed with a cotton bud which has been soaked in isopropyl alcohol. The very last thing that should be done is to attach the canopy, the wheels and associated doors, and any antennas or wires where appropriate. We have now come to the end of the first episode in the Teaching Techniques series. We hope that you have enjoyed the journey and learned new things. While these techniques alone will produce an impressive result, they are only the foundation on which further, more advanced weathering and painting techniques can be applied but that will be covered in future episodes. We wish you great success with mastering these techniques and all the best with your future builds. Until next time.